Welcome to the Nerdist Podcast number 816. This episode brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a landing page, a gallery, a blog, an online store, it is all included with your Squarespace website. Uh, start your free trial today, squarespace.com. Enter the offer code NERDIST to get 10% off your first purchase. Uh, more about Squarespace in a second, but I'm here to talk to you also about the Nerdist Community Corkboard. These are corkboard items from the Nerdist community, which might be you, probably you. I'm going to guess it's you if you're listening. Uh, this is Guy Who Didn't Write In His Name. Uh, my great friends Rick Horchie, Tommy Roulette, and Pete Woodward, who don't know I'm writing this, are doing a Futurama podcast, Slurmcast, a podcast for no reason. They take a hilarious look at each episode, dissecting, diverging, and delving into the episode's meaning and what it means to them. I'm personally super envious of them and wished I thought of doing it first. Envy is a good emotion. Anyone will tell you that. Uh, but you're a kind man, a uh, guy who didn't write in his name. You can download Slurmcast on iTunes or reach them at Pod. On the tweets, good news, everyone. James Bowers, I'm the writer with the help of a wonderful Scottish artist by the name of Michelle Henderson. We put together a submission sample for our original comic book series. My Dad Death follows a socially awkward high schooler who learns his dad is the Grim Reaper. The role is hereditary, and Orion, having been plunged into a supernatural world and struggling to straddle between that and the boring normal realm, will have to learn the trade in a black comedy series with a unique art. We have submitted to Image Comics and are currently waiting to hear back. Please visit MyDadDeath.com to keep up with our progress. Should Image decline to take it on, then we aim to crowdfund it. Good for you, making your thing. Very proud of you, Nerdist Community Corkboard. Uh, also just announced guests for next week at the Nerdist Podcast Live at San Diego Comic-Con. Uh, the 7 p.m. show, Tatiana Maslani and... Danny McBride and Walton Goggins uh, from Vice Principals and a bunch of other stuff that you love. 10 o'clock show, Mystery Science Theater's Joel Hodgson, uh, along with Bruce Campbell. Of course, the sister wives, Matt Myra and Jonah Ray, will be at both shows. I will be there. We'll do comments. We'll have fun. Tickets, uh, you can go to id10t.com. ID, the number 10, T.com uh, for the ticket links there. And also the Friday night at 7 p.m., I'm doing stand-up from the ID 10T tour. So uh, that is all new tour, all new stuff, not the stuff that aired in the special. Come out and see that. I'm doing a ton of panels, too. I'm not sure I'm allowed to. Let's see, what am I allowed to announce so far? I can announce I'm doing South Park. I'm doing, obviously, The Walking Dead's Fear and The Regular Walking Dead. I'm doing... Um, what else am I allowed to say? I can't remember what I'm doing. The DreamWorks panel. I'm doing a couple more. Oh, Sherlock. I'm doing Sherlock. Uh, I don't know what else I'm allowed to announce. I don't know. Uh, but I guess we'll find out soon. So go to Nerdist.com for all that info. Uh, this episode is Paul Dini. A fantastic nerd. A wonderful pillar of the nerd community who has worked on and written for... Many things that you have probably enjoyed, not the least of which are Batman the Animated Series, uh, Batman Arkham Asylum, Batman Arkham City. Uh, He worked on uh, Freakazoid. He's worked on Transformers, Animaniacs, Justice League, Justice League Unlimited. And uh, he currently has a book right now, which you should definitely pick up, called... Uh, Dark Knight, A True Batman Story, which is based on a real-life thing that happened to him that we talk about. And he's very open. And uh, if you're going through stuff or if you've been through stuff and you haven't processed it yet, this is a good podcast for you to listen to. Also, just because of all the kind of collecting talk that we get into as well. So uh, this is a good... I feel like this podcast really runs the gamut of emotions in the best way. And Paul's such a sweet guy. And uh, I was really honored and glad to have him on because I've, I've enjoyed his work for many years. Uh, and he's a good man. Uh, this episode, as I said earlier, brought to you by Squarespace. What do you need? What do you need? You need some kind of a blog or a gallery or a land, even just a landing page. Everything, whatever you need, creating your own web entity with Squarespace is simple. It's intuitive. Add and arrange your content and features with just simple clicks. Free custom domain, Squarespace, making adding domain to your site simple. If you sign up for a year, you're going to receive custom domain for a free year. Beautiful templates and, uh, and really easy commerce tools. If you want to sell stuff, nationally recognized brands, use it, local shops, just regular old people who just want to sell one thing. Customer support is fantastic 24-7. Every member of the customer care team is an experienced Squarespace user. Uh, so you're not just going to get someone reading from a script. They're working in the Squarespace office. No matter how technical your problem or trivial seeming your question, uh, one of their team is always online to assist you. 
Start your free trial today at squarespace.com. Enter the offer code NERDIST to get 10% off your first purchase. And thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Squarespace, set your website apart. Uh, now here's the NERDIST podcast number 816 with Paul Dini. This is Chris Hardwick of Team Mystic. Pokemon Go. Oh, I am in it. I am in it. While you're listening to this podcast, I'm going to be out trying to catch fucking Pokemon in my neighborhood, making me walk outside and interact with other people. What the hell? What happened to the old days video games? You just didn't talk to anybody. Now I got to interact with people. Uh, but I like it. And I also like Paul Dini. Here he is. Now, Katie, please roll the thing. Now entering Nerdist.com. convinced that's how we were talking about George Lucas coming out with characters. I'm convinced like he's typing uh, bad guy enters his name is <laughs> Seize 11. Seize 11. Seize 11. Yeah. <laughs> Just whatever. You know, whatever, whatever he take, he's at hand, you know. So I worked did for him for a few years. Did you, did you ever see uh, I'm the, the, a classic uh, George Lucas in Love? I'm sure you must have seen it. I did, I did. Yeah. I thought that was really funny. Some friends of mine made that did, like in 2000. Yeah. Three, I think it was. Mm-hmm. It was before people were making web videos. Mm-hmm. Really, mm-hmm. what did you do for George? I worked on Ewoks and Droids. Oh, right, way back when the animated know. Ewok yeah. show. Yeah, so that was that was interesting. He sort of got that started and walked away from it forever. And uh, <laughs> whatever you want to do, just just yeah, just, <laughs> noticing a pattern with him. Just do some stuff. <laughs> it was a weird point because he had just opened Skywalker Ranch and he. Uh, and he had he said he was kind of retiring for the first time from making movies, and he just said, "I'm done with Star Wars. I just want to do my own thing, and maybe I'll make some little art movies later." And he was having, you know, he was going through a, a separation and a divorce at the time, also. So he he had personal things elsewhere. But the I was there around just till they started making the last Indiana Jones movies. Mm-hmm. I was there between. Uh, Temple of Doom and the Last Crusade, right. and uh, so I got to see Tucker and Howard the Duck and uh, a bunch of other, you know, Willow. Uh, Howard the Duck, Howard the Duck. Even when How- even at the age I was, and when Howard the Duck came out, everything in my brain said, "Well, how could you not love this movie?" And even yeah. at that time, I was like, uh, "I don't know what just happened." Yeah, it's like the Duck World was amazing, and then they leave it. Yeah. And then the whole like whole act three dark overlords of the universe business. I just uh, you just described like, Man of Steel. Yeah, yeah, yeah there you Krypton go. Krypton was amazing, <laughs> and uh, and uh, Hancock too. Yeah. There was another yeah. one. It was like, oh, it's going great. What? They're angel. What, what? is fucking yeah. happening? Spoiler alert! She, I remember I, uh, when I was working at Lucas, my sister w- was saying to me, you know, you never take me to a movie premiere. I mean, the, I didn't get to go to Goonies. I didn't get to go to, you know, the, the other movies that I, you know, that, that opened around there that I got invited to. And I said, okay, the next one comes up, I'll take you to that. So the next one was Howard the Duck. So I took her to the, <laughs> the screening for that. And after the end of the movie, she just kind of looked at me and then punched me real hard. <laughs> And the follow-up to the story is years later, we go to see Guardians of the Galaxy. And we're really enjoying it all the way through it. I have no idea what it is. And I go, you got to stay to the end. There's always a tag of some sort at the end. And so at the very end, the tag comes on. She goes, oh, Howard the Duck! And she hits it's me above again. the other time. Yeah, yeah. Did you go to the Goonies premiere? Yeah, well, whatever they had in San Francisco. Yes, I did. I did. Because uh, the, the kid who played Chunk was there. And he was dressed up in kind of a, a white tuxedo and... Showing off and stuff like that. So whatever the the, the company premiere was in San Rafael, they, that that was it. So it was, yeah. So I guess so. You know, whatever whatever they called it at that point, it was not like a big Hollywood thing, but it was like a big show they had for the uh, big uh, enough to Island get Chunk people. out there. You know? Yeah, Chunk was there and he was he was good. We've yeah. talked about this. He's an entertainer. He's a lawyer now. Yes. Yeah, lawyer now. Yeah. And 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 also, I love. I've never met him, but I love that he loves. That he was chunk, like he yeah. genuinely embraces it, yeah, and I think that's fantastic. Yeah, I'm sorry they never made a follow up to that, and and for years they talked about it, but I guess they could never get all the rights together or anything like that. Uh, not long ago, I worked on an animated treatment for it with uh, some guys at Warner Brothers, and that was almost a go, you know, like uh, animated Goonies, and 
they worked out the licensing rights, uh, the likeness rights and stuff like that, and it was all ready to go. But, there again, there were so many high-level people involved in it that it just sort of – Brolin? You got Brolin, you get Brolin on board? Uh, yeah, everybody got involved with it. Everybody signed off on it. I want that bumper sticker. And Brolin then, on board. Brolin on board. <laughs> I think it was the, high, the, the gods high up, uh, Donner and, and Warner. And I, I, I can't even begin to say, but I just heard it was – you know, it, it had nothing to do with what we did. It just you know, I'm, I mean, you've – You've you've worked on a lot of amazing things. I am so thank you interested to hear about your time at Filmation. Oh yeah, I mean that period of animation uh-huh. was such a. I mean, now it it you know to me it's very it's yeah. very nostalgic. But mm-hmm. I, I I I loved animation. You know, mm-hmm. was a huge mm-hmm. fan of Clampett and Chuck Jones. And sure. So so when all of the when when animation for television kind of st- got real cheap in the '60s and then through the '80s, yeah. You know, I mean, I watched all of it. I oh, watched yeah. Transformers. I uh-huh. watched GI Joe. I uh-huh. watched all the Filmation stuff. But uh-huh. uh, Filmation, in particular, just had such a specific vibe Ooh, to it. I guess you could call it a vibe, or a <laughs> smell to it, or something. Uh, yeah, it did. You know, I'll say Filmation was really interesting around you know 1980 because that was people who were just starting their career or just ending it. There was nobody in the middle. You had old timers who had animated some really great stuff for Looney Tunes or some Disney stuff who were just sort of kind of working past retirement to make a little extra money. And then you had guys like me who were like 20, 21, just coming in. I was, I, I, the first things I wrote for Filmation, I was still in college. You know, I got a, a job just sort of freelancing and, and making some money, sending in some story ideas. But it was uh, – you had guys like uh, Bruce Tim and uh, John Chris Belusi. Oh, know, my they, God. They all came through there at one point. I didn't know another. John Kay worked on uh, f- through a filmation. I, I, I think – yeah, I believe he did. There were guys like Kent Butterworth who were working with him. And um, everybody kind of drifted through there at one point because they needed a lot of talent. They were selling a lot of shows to get on the air. Uh, and compete with Hanna Barbera, so they needed just about anybody. If you could hold a pencil, you were there. I was I was way too crappy an artist to make it at Filmation, but they liked my gag, so I I was I was a writer for for a while. And uh, some of the stuff that came through there. The other night I, I was flipping around, and my wife and I were uh, tuned on a boomerang for a mm-hmm. second, and one of the Filmation Tom and Jerry's came on. It's just, it's just she goes, what is this? Was this animated by kids? And I said. No, it was a filmation, Tom and Jerry. Everything about it is bad. The lettering on the title card is bad. The posing on the, the characters The timing is, bad. is really is – really, it's almost like they're it's, like, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's animated on 16th, you know. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and the, the music is – Yeah, they weren't, even, they weren't even really trying. It's one guy with a Casio keyboard. I don't know who did the music, but he must have been related to Lou Scheimer because Lou always <laughs> – Lou Scheimer! Lou Scheimer always spread the money around with his family, and it's like you could do anything. He – He'd hire you because he didn't have to. Oh have my to, god! All know. those all those Lou Scheimer adventure cartoons. Oh yeah, and he was the voice of all those characters. He and was. He was the voice of almost ninety. You know, like maybe not ninety, but a lot of the characters. You know, you hear him talking like this. You know, and uh, Lou's, Lou's, Lou's regular voice was something like this. And then when he would do a character voice, it'd be like, hey, well, gee, he man, I just want to help. And he was the voice <laughs> of all the little Nyanya characters, like Orko and. <laughs> Half the characters in Fat Albert are him, and I was on, I was on the set of a Kevin Smith movie, Jay and Silent Bob, of and um, I'm talking to Chris Rock during the uh, doing a, a shooting break. We're talking about cartoons, and he said, "You know, Bill Cosby did all the voices on Fat Albert." And I said, "No, he didn't." And he goes, "What do you mean?" I said, "That was Lou Scheimer. He was doing, you know, it was like hey, Fat Albert." <laughs> Let's go down a swimming hole. That was that dumb seems, Donald. You know, he was seems really socially inappropriate. I know. And, and poor Chris, he was like, there's no Santa Claus. What the hell do you mean? And uh, well, that was the worst thing Cosby was ever involved. In. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> oh, wait. He didn't know. It I mean, was way worse. He thought they would, they would actually, you know, cast young African-American kids. But they, you know, it was just Lou and his family. doing. Oh, I got it. I'll yeah. do it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Lou was you know he, he was well known for keeping animation in the United States longer than anybody else, but you know he he had at what cost? At what cost? There you go. There you go. So but, did you start? Uh, did, was animation your first? Is if you started in college, was that your first career track? Uh, for the most part, I was always obsessed with cartoons and comic books. You know, growing up, and I and I could not imagine a career doing something that was not tangentially rate, uh, related to that in some form or another. So I studied creative writing in college and acting, you know, things I'm guaranteed to not get a job doing after school. But somehow 
excuse me, I, I, I managed to impress the people at Filmation enough that I was able to, you know, get in there and sell some story ideas. And once that happened, hi, I worked over at Filmation. Can I get a job here? And then Hanna Barbera says, yeah, here, here, write some Smurfs and stuff like that. There was a lot of Saturday morning. <laughs> Fucking Smurfs everywhere. Yeah. This place Sat- is lousy with Smurfs. Saturday morning car- yeah, cartoons. the script is the ever- word Smurf. Smurf, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, you, yeah, it's real easy to Smurf this. And so from Hanna Barbera, from Filmation, I went to Hanna Barbera and drifted around all the places. There was like a to Patty Freeling, which was doing some Marvel yeah. characters, and then they there, did the older Tom and Jerry's too. Did, yeah, and, and to Patty Freeling did the um, the Pink Panther yeah. series as yeah. well. Yeah, I think they had just finished up Pink Panther a few years before I got in the business. They were the last studio to do, still do theatrical cartoons like Ant and the Aardvark and a couple of others. Uh, Pink Panther. And, yeah, the Ant and the Aardvark was. I always remember. I I loved the Ant and Aardvark, but I don't know if, if it necessarily holds. I don't know if that's no. one that really holds up. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would watch those, and and that was, I the the movie theater in the town I grew up in was one screen big theater, and they still showed cartoons up until the eighties, and I w- they would run an Ant and an Aardvark, and I'm going like, why is the Ant talking like Dean Martin? Yeah, and I don't know who the Aardvark's supposed to be. Jackie but, Mason. Jackie Mason. Yeah, but he sounded like a Borscht Belt comedian. Right. And, uh, hey, Ant, what are you gonna do with him? What are you gonna do with him? Yeah, I, I'm gonna mosey on over here. Hey, think, Aardvark, we're gonna have ourselves a little cookout. Yeah, it was all that kind of. I'm watching this. I'm going, why did Bugs Bunny retire? <laughs> <laughs> well, Fritz Freeling did Bugs Bunnies too. They yeah. just they just weren't that great. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. it was really kind of the doubt. I mean, it's like you know when animation was new, it was yeah. just this bold like it's like yeah. film. Yeah, let's let's really you know like they made them like films, and then when they when they figured out how to you know yeah. d- do everything in uh, like uh, uh, do half the frames and yes. half the and you know more and less drawings and more it mm-hmm. was, was real. Who's your favorite, uh, Bob Clampett or no? Well, I like Clampett, but um, I just think for overall vibe and kind of character construction, I just think Chuck Jones. I mean, yeah. in, in those days, Chuck Jones. Yeah, I think Clampett did a lot of really interesting things, but I think Chuck really all of his characters looked like they had skeletons. Yes, and uh, Chuck also did Three Bears, which I loved. Yeah, um, and uh, but his work. His work kind of got a little weirder as he got older, as we yes. got into the 50s and 60s. Something about that period of time influenced the art in a way across all of them that I just didn't really jump out to me. So I was mm-hmm. really more of a, like, the, the 40s to me, mm-hmm. and right before McKimson came in mm-hmm. to Warner Brothers, like, that was, the, that was my favorite yeah. period. Yeah, yeah. Before they made Daffy Duck a fucking asshole. Like, oh, yeah, just like, yeah. They're like, I guess we can't have two crazy characters, so we'll just make this one a, a narcissistic piece of shit. I didn't like those. Uh, I, I love the cartoon Nasty Quacks, which is, uh, I think, uh, that's uh, by, um, oh, come on, you know, the guy, he went on to d- direct live action. Uh, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll come back to me. Uh, Tashlin. And uh, it was, uh, it's the one where he's adopted as a duckling by a little girl, and he grows up to be the family pet. Yes. And he's a total asshole, but he's hysterical. <laughs> he's sitting at the table, what a party, what a party. <laughs> Furniture's going in the window and coming out the door. <laughs> you know, some guy kicked the cock at- Cop and start all over again, and he's just so rowdy and so joyful. He's like a little sprite in that cartoon, and that's like my favorite Daffy Duck. Yeah, that, that, uh, that's kind of how Homer started out as really like dopey, and yeah, and, and like it wasn't until like six or seven seasons in that he just became angry all the time. Yeah, yeah. but I always loved when the characters were dopier rather than just like zero mm-hmm. to rage. Well, I think you know, I think the three Chuck Jones duck rabbit duck hunting cartoons are great, but I also think they really limited those characters because suddenly it got to be really easy to make Daffy the jerk and Bugs the guy who only reacts. Right. And I think that, you know, what Chuck Jones did in those cartoons was brilliant, but I thought other directors and story people said, oh, well, that's it. Daffy's just a greedy asshole from now on. <laughs> and that, that limited the characters, and so, you know. And Chuck also did my um, one of my favorite of all, which is The Dot and the Line, yes. which I bought. I, oh, I, oh, I owned great. four cells from it. Wow. Um, and... Uh, but then in the '80s, you know, it just it it, I, and I watched all of it. But it really, I guess, was, it was just a financial thing. Was that it? Well, you know, I, I think it was a few things. I think that Maltese had left, and I think Michael Maltese and Chuck Jones made a great team, and Mike really contributed a lot as far as subject matter for the cartoons. Like he was the idea who came up with the idea for. He came up with the idea for things like What's Opera Doc and right. The Singing Frog and everything mm-hmm. like that. And Chuck, you know, these are, they're great Chuck cartoons, but I think 
Mike was always looking around for a different way to tell a story and interesting pairings of characters. And I think that after he left in about 58 or 59 to go write for Hanna-Barbera, they hired him over there. They paid him a lot of money to come in and develop you know, Yogi Bear and stuff like that. I think that Chuck was left to his own devices or there were other story men who weren't quite as good. They were doing the standard Looney Tunes stuff. And he made some good cartoons in there. But I think that after he left or was fired from, from Warner's, however that shook down in like 63 – I think he was away from it for a while, and then when he came back, he had different animators, a few of the old-timers, but he didn't have Maltese. And I think his, his philosophy had changed. Uh, I think that, you know, I love Chuck, and I, I got to know him a little bit, but I think in the late 70s, early 80s, he became the maestro. And, right. and he was, he, that's when the white suit and the hat and the Mark Twain quotations started showing up, and and Bugs didn't wasn't a character who did funny stuff. He was a character who put on a smoking jacket and talked about when he used to do funny <laughs> right, stuff. Right, right, right. And very precious. His 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 chin came down into his shoulders and half closed eyes and carried a carrot like it was a cigarette. And and <laughs> nobody did anything funny at that point. It was all kind of like really twee, precious wordplay that wasn't funny. Right. And uh, you know, but it was you can forgive him that for. The decades that went oh, before well, that. there's no question. I mean, I, it's... The Dover Boys alone. I mean, come on. The Dover Boys. <laughs> the Dover Boys. I run about. I'll steal it. No one will ever know. <laughs> Who writes shit like that? It's just so great. I mean, it's, and it's said with such conviction and, and joy. It's, it's well, a terrific it's, cartoon. Was that, um, because I remember when John Kay, after, yes. because John, John had, John really seemed to develop on Mighty Mouse under Bakshi and then. Yes. And then came, and then Ren and Stimpy came around mm-hmm. in the early '90s, and I watched Ren and Stimpy in first run. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, and it, he seemed to have this philosophy of like, you know, we want to empower the artists again. Yes. Yeah. Um, so how did that affect the writers? You know, that were, was it still was this movement good for people who wrote animation who were not animators? Well, you know, uh, John's an interesting case. I worked with him a little bit on a on a revival of Beanie and Cecil. The, yes, the, the, of course. They didn't get Another get very Clampett. far. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have a uh, he and I have a mutual love of, of Bob Clampett, and he can tell you not only you know what Clampett did in a cartoon. He can tell you you know here's where Rob Rod Scribner you know was drawing, and you know he knows he knows each of the drawings by the animators' names. Um, John has always been under the uh, the conviction that writers, traditional writers for Saturday morning cartoons, have no place in animation. Like that, and I get what he's talking about because if you're a young guy who's coming in, guy or girl who's who's loved animation and come in burning to do something as good as, uh, you know, uh, the Dover Boys or or uh, What's Opera Doc or something, you're given a script that is kind of that all the shots are called the gags aren't really funny and you're really kind of chained to just laboring through it so i understand the resentment of artists who have to you know work on stuff like that and um and a lot of those scripts just aren't very funny but i i was paired up with him on the beanie and cecil show and i wanted and i knew the way he worked and i wanted to work more that way and he was always advocating let's just write a little s- short outline I'll let the storyboard artist and the director go to work on it, and we'll make a really funny cartoon, which is great. However, you got you got two things working against you. One, you got a network that doesn't really understand that, and at the time, it was really repressive working under the network, you know, uh, uh, chain of command at that right. point, where they wanted creative input and censorship and every on everything, and you couldn't just make a funny cartoon and hand it in. That would have been great. They would it would it's like if you suddenly know the answer to a math problem, the teacher wants you to show the work. How did you work every step of the way? And in cartoons, it was like, you have to bring us every step of the way because we don't know if what you're doing is funny and we have to have our print on it. And John <laughs> was, as attitude was like, just trust me, I'll, I'll deliver a funny cartoon. The other problem was, it's really tough doing that on a schedule, like a Saturday morning schedule, and trying to turn that work in on time, especially when you've got a bunch of artists who all have creative voices and you might be starting down the path in one cartoon and then going away and it's like, it's okay, but I want to start again. That eats up time. And you know, I, I remember that we were running late on a few things, partially because of artistic choices, mainly because it was just really hard getting stuff by the network. They were not in a position to, to trust very much. So, um, I think that was uh, uh, that was a, 
um, one of the factors why. Well, his philosophy, I, if I remember his philosophy, credit was something like, if you can shut your eyes and still know what's going on, it's not a real cartoon. Well, that's right. That's you're right. listening to animated radio. Basically. Yeah, you're animated radio. Animated radio. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it's like, you know, it and the, the cartoons he's made, I mean, he's he's definitely proven that, that he can make them like that. It's, it's just that... It's weird that he is uh, – he's an, in many ways an animation auteur who can, with very little help, make a cartoon himself and it's really terrific. But he needs the time and support to do that. Um, there's, But you can't say – you can't hold that up for the rest of the industry that just can't do that. Right. I mean there's a reason Disney movies take four years to, to be created <laughs> because they, they'll putz around forever with the story and you have a lot of people contributing ideas. Um and and that'll set the story on a different uh, route. And then if the story works, it's great. But sometimes it just it just flounders about. But um, you know, the more people who can contribute, the more of an interesting product you're going to. Yeah, get. and it is. And in animation and good animation is expensive. It's yeah, expensive yeah. to do. And I, I met with him a few years ago about just doing some stuff for our YouTube channel mm-hmm. and we started talking i'm like oh, i don't know maybe we might have the budget and he started talking numbers and I'm like oh we don't i i'm no. sorry i don't have that <laughs> that's no. too much for yeah. us and i appreciate that you need that and i agree with you mm-hmm. but we don't have you know like classic tv budgets no i mean I, I would love it if the money existed to do independent animated cartoons and at least in my case it, it doesn't work out money wise or time wise the most i can do is kind of work work with an artist and do Characters that I like as comic strips and put them on my website or do, you know, small stories here and there. And and that's fine because that gives me a chance to create something new. I mean, the early 90s really was the renaissance for animation mm-hmm. because not, o- not only do you have John Cage doing this stuff over here, but then Warner Brothers yeah. is doing this whole, like, not just the action adventure stuff, but also the, you know, the the refurbishment of... You know, mm-hmm. bringing out Tiny Toons and right. Animaniacs, and mm-hmm. so you you worked in the original Batman animated series, did you? Yes, not? Mm-hmm. yes, um, which is really kind of the definitive animated Batman yeah. series, uh, the Kevin it's the Conroy definitive Batman you. series. Yeah, oh, Kevin's the definitive Batman. He's the definitive yeah. Batman, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, me too. So what? You know, and I've uh, we, I've actually had Andrea Romano on the podcast. Oh yeah, she's before, great. Too, yeah, I a, love her. It was amazing. Yeah. So. Did, were you involved from the get-go with that, or did you did you slide in after a bit? Uh, well, yes to both. Actually, what happened was we um, I was hired in '89 to work on the development on Tiny Toons. It was it was fairly well underway. Tom Ruger, who was a writer and producer at Warner Brothers Animation and sort of like the creative head there under Gene McCurdy, was spearheading Tiny Toon Adventures, which was a co-production with Amblin and, and Steven Spielberg. So Steven and Tom and a couple of writers had were mapping out where they wanted to go with Tiny Toons. And I'd worked with Tom before, and I was living up in San Francisco, uh, finishing up at, at Lucasfilm. And he said, why don't you come on down? We're going to be doing this show. It's going to be a couple of years, at least, you know, working on it. And you want to be a part of this? And I said, yeah, because I liked working with him, and I liked the artists. And uh, I came back down, and... Um, we started on Tiny Toons, and that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of trial and error, and it was, uh, but there was a lot of encouragement to do your best because Warner's had started this agreement with Steven Spielberg and with Fox, and Fox really wanted to make good cartoons. And also, Steven had just made Roger Rabbit the year before, and he was really in love with the idea of doing classic animation, not stuff that just moved well, but what sounded well. And he was always an advocate of, we got to have an orchestra in here playing, like the, like the old-time guys. And I looked at something recently, I guess uh, I was watching, um, we had a short cartoon called The Anvil Chorus, where it's one anvil after another being dropped on Plucky Duck. And the music in that is just tremendous, because... Bruce Broughton, who did the music at the time, and his team of, of musicians really went in and looked at the old uh, Milt Franklin and uh, Bill Lava and uh, Carl Starling stuff yeah. and really found a way to do that for TV. And so even in, in some of the animation in Tiny Toons was kind of hit or miss because it was going to a bunch of different studios. And we farmed out a few episodes to people who said, yeah, we can do old style Warner Brothers animation. And it's like, no, no, you can't. <laughs> so a lot of this stuff, you know, first season, first couple of episodes was a bit hit or miss. But it all sounded good because the music was uh, top quality. The production values, you know, were, were as good as they could be. And we had a young crew that was coming in who really wanted to make funny cartoons, who wanted to do their stamp on the Warner Brothers cartoons. Just And at the same time, 
across town at Disney, you had animators and directors working on things like Little Mermaid and gearing up to do Aladdin and things. It's the same thing. Like, I grew up on Disney cartoons. I want to make a Disney cartoon. So it really was kind of a generational thing. Yeah. Just like that pocket of people who grew up watching that said, okay... A lot of the stuff in the 80s is cheap it, shit. You yeah. need to really focus on making the animation great again. Yes. And then you had the cowboys and cowgirls who were like working at Warner's or Disney or the other places who were going like, I don't want to do this stuff. I want to do something really cool. And they went off and did Spumco. You know, so you had a bunch <laughs> of the more rebellious types, you know, and John was over there. Hey, come here. I'm, I'm doing cool stuff. And so they went off and did, you know, Ren and Stimpy and, and, and those cartoons. I drive, I drive by their building all the time. It was just this shitty little building on Melrose. On Melrose, Mauer. yeah. Yeah. And it yeah. Just, yeah, I'll show you the millions of my map, but it, you'd never. It's the most. It looks like a weird discount dental office. Yes, building. exactly. And all the signs out front are the same. They have these. They're just like white with this like I think blue lettering. Yeah. And Spumco had the most nondescript. I mean, yeah. I literally. I, I was at UCLA at the time, and I was in the animation program for a yeah. while, and I just called. Uh huh. <laughs> I called and first of all said I was writing an article for the UCLA Bruin newspaper, which I was yeah. not. I uh-huh. just wanted to get John Kay on the phone. Oh, I've done that before. Oh, it totally worked. Yeah, I got into Tex Avery's you? office. You're that way. Yes. Oh, that's yes. fucking great. Yeah, yeah. Did he ever find out that you weren't writing this story? Oh, he knew. <laughs> <laughs> what oh, did you he, ask him? I said, uh, uh, Red Hot Riding Hood, how'd you do it? And he said, oh, I had a bunch of, you know, and nobody but Preston Blair could, could animate her. And when he left, we stopped doing them. And, you know, he kind of didn't want to talk about it. He was just kind of... Uh, you know, a guy, a surly guy on his on his lunch break, and I talked for him for a little bit, and then, you know, a, a little bit. You know, it was more like, "Thank you very much." And now I got to go back to drawing Cave Mouse and <laughs> stuff. What he, what he was doing, and he was sharing an office with Mark Evanier at the time. Oh my god! And uh, but he was he was there, and I met some of the old timers at at Hanna Barbera that way, and and a lot of the story editors and people, and and uh, I actually did write cobble together something, and it got out in like some fan magazine, but not really like newsstand yeah. stuff. It was more like they used to have appas and things like that at the time and fan networks but long before the so, internet you, you just made me feel so much better yeah about about that old that old ploy oh yeah oh yeah i mean it's just at the time there was no way you couldn't just email people you yeah. had to like fucking call someone had to be there yeah like, it was a whole oh well, i get it too you know i got i got a you know hey mr dini i'm a i'm a reporter for the la times and uh, Mickey Mouse? Yeah, it's like, yeah, I want to come. Can I hear you? Okay, kid, come on over. What do you want to know? I know you're not a reporter. But let's just, just, you know, just meet me at Starbucks and I'll answer some questions. So. What, what, kind of, what are the common questions that you get from people? And besides, I mean, uh, is it always the, uh, how do you start? How do you do this? It's and, usually, how can I get your job? Right. <laughs> it's like Mark Wade and I were talking one night and we came to the conclusion, we, we don't have fans. We have people who want our jobs. They're just a little more pleasant about it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, usually it's, how do I get started? Um, will you will you write something with me? Do you, you let me show you my drawings? Things like that, and uh, it's it's more more like that. They're, they're looking for an entry into the business, as we were, you know. So, uh, but I think more of it is like you know we were able to talk to people whose work we grew up with, and uh, and and develop some sort of connection with them and then actually find out some certain technical things. Like I had a chance to meet Chuck Jones on several occasions and you'd go out to dinner with him. And then I would really bug him like, okay, what did Mike do? What did you do? And how was, how did it work? And he'd say, well, Mike would draw everything, but it was always little thumbnails and he'd go through it and, and how he would, how he would direct the, the picture and stuff like that. Some of the stuff when I would talk to Chuck was stories I'd heard before because I think they were, easy for him to tell and uh but sometimes he would talk about the actual you know the process and uh, and things like that and directing and directing did you utilize any of that stuff uh, were you able ever able to uh as much as i could you know one of the things i i learned from not only them but also from john and 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 a bunch of other animators and there's there's a few things you that they all say and it's true and it's draw as much as you can and i'm a, a terrible artist but when i do a, a especially a funny cartoon like a Tom and Jerry or something like that, I will sketch out as much as I can of little quick little thumbnail action. And that's where gags come from, you know, to like, you know, size relationships because the cat's big, the mouse is tiny and, and, or, you know, uh, surprise gags and, and everything. So I fill up a sketchbook or a legal pad with 
with scribbles as I'm drawing. And some, sometimes if I'm feeling confident about it, I'll copy it and I'll send it to the director and I'll say, what about something like, like a gag like this? And if he likes it, he'll do it in his own style and, and it'll get in the picture. But it helps me because if I have to, if I can visualize it first, then I can type it in a kind of brief shorthand that the director and the and the storyboard are. are well, that's already at. a wealth of information for anyone who wants to write yeah. animation. It's yeah. just learn how to learn how to create it visually first, and then and then write in the stuff after that. So, how does that work then with Batman, which I feel like is probably works more like just a traditional drama series? Yeah, yeah, to a de- to a great degree. I mean, with Batman, as a writer, I would have the most success coming up with an, an, an emotional story or an emotional problem in a story like uh, I've told the story before like uh, for the Mr. Freeze episode I thought okay here's a guy who's dead to emotion or claims to be what's the most emotional ending I can give him and I I worked backwards and I said I want him sitting in a cell crying and his tears turning into snow I thought that's kind of a cool image and that's kind of evocative of you know some some stuff I've I've, I've seen before I was thinking part of it I was thinking of an old Japanese movie called uh, Kaidan which is about a Part of it is like a, a guy trapped in the snow and there's a snow goddess and it's very atmospheric and, and things like that. And some of it was old things like Dr. Fibes, you know, the guy, the the tortured phantom type character pining for a, a lost love and things like that. So – but working back from that visual of him, of, of, of the snow in the, in, the, in, the, in the cell was really kind of what got me thinking, OK, how do I get to that point? So – that's the end. What what gets to the point? And you know, so Freeze has to be a real cold-hearted bastard up front for you to feel anything for him at the end. And um, and then everything just sort of worked into place. I just you know played around with the story until I had an outline, and I talked to uh, Alan Burnett and Bruce Tim. I was I was not I, uh, you know I was not actually working on the show at that at that point. What what had happened? Just to, we got away from the original question. I had worked early on on Tiny Toons for about a season or two, and during that time, I had done some development work on the Bible for Batman with with Bruce Tim and and Eric Radomski, and who was also doing the backgrounds and uh, coming up with the styling for the show. Then I left the studio for about six months to work on a movie, and during that time, Alan Burnett came in to be supervising producer. And also supervised the the writing, so I wrote a few freelance scripts for him, and I really enjoyed working with him. And then he said, "Well, if you want to come back, there's a full time job for you." And I said, "Okay, sure." So I came back, but but Heart of Ice was one of the scripts I wrote when I was away, and I was kind of left to my own devices. And I just said, "I, th- I think this is kind of good." Did you guys think you were, were were you in your head? Were you saying, "Oh, we're going back to this old type of Batman," or was there a specific thing you had in your mind, or "Oh, we're doing something completely new," especially coming off the the Burton yeah. Bat- Batman, which was a different kind of a thing. And you really – it's almost – it's like the Batman animated series is almost kind of the same thing that Nolan did. Yeah. It's like, okay, we're going to ground it again mm-hmm. and we're going to make it you know, cool and action-y but not super cartoony. Right. Well, there was, there was um, visually and, and contextually, I think, there was, a, there, was some suge- there was some suggestion from Warner Brothers to – Use some elements of the Tim Burton movies. Like at that point, Batman Returns was coming out. So the version of Catwoman and Penguin kind of echoed what Burton had done in the movies. We didn't want to do like the Tim Burton stylization, like the more like the Edward Scissorhands or um, mm. Beetlejuice type of stylization. We wanted to do something that was more akin to Fleischer. And that it would have a 20th century look, but almost impossible to pinpoint any specific decade. Mm -hmm. So that there were TVs and computer screens, but they were only in black and white. So, you know, when you, when Bruce Wayne dressed up, it was always in a tuxedo or a suit and everybody's elegantly dressed and the villains have a kind of, you know, modern yet old style gangster feel to them. Basically what we wanted to do was make, Take every element that we thought we, that we felt was cool or uh, visually attractive of Batman through his whole fifty year history at that point, and make uh, a, a kind of a series out of that. So there were things that we just didn't like, like a lot of the Adam West stuff we left aside, even though we loved it as kids. It just tonally, it just didn't work. We left a lot of like the Justice League of it out. Part of, part of that was. We had the rights mainly to Batman at that point, and they weren't figuring out what to do with the other superheroes. But we also wanted to do 
pretty much a, a, a set world with, that didn't have superheroes or a lot of magic or the supernatural in it. And that sort of creeped in eventually uh, over the years. But for the first couple of seasons, we, we wanted to stay away from that and really make it very much centered on Bruce, on, uh, on, on Rob and on Alfred and Gordon and really explore as much as we could like the, the real nature of it, such as in, like in Mask of the Phantasm. That's, that's almost a, a live action script. Mm-hmm. It dies very much into the continuity of, of our series, but it's a, a really good story because it begins and ends with Bruce Wayne, which I think is the best Batman stories, or the ones that fo- focus heavily on him. When you've got a big story that's like a villain – villain romp and he batman's kind of a traffic cop uh, uh you know I, I, <laughs> the villains had better be engaging because batman's not doing much and uh and uh, you know you don't want to leave him out of it too much so then around this time this is early 90s yes uh-huh. and then this sort of dovetails into one of the things that you were coming to talk about yes. today uh-huh. which was the the horrible mugging that oh happened yeah. In yeah 1993 which do you know do you know this oh i do i read you, the you book? read it today okay. yeah. good 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 so uh, just sort of walk us through a little bit what, you know, and I'm even I apologize if you're tired of talking. No, about no, this, no, 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 just gives no, context. Uh-uh. And then also, you know, then we'll start getting into like how that affected you moving forward and why and how you were able to sort of all these years later then start mm-hmm. kind of processing it. So what happened? Well, uh, it was an interesting time in my life because the show had the Batman the Animated Series had debuted like four or five months prior to that. So it was early uh, to 1993, and we were getting a lot of attention on the show. They had just greenlit uh, the Batman movie, which would be known as Mask of the Phantasm. We had been picked up for another se- another season of episodes, and we knew that the hard work we had done over the the year and a half prior to the show's debut was starting to pay off, and we we're feeling really good, you know, about where we were going. And I personally at that time was leading what I look back on as a sort of geek perfect life where I'm <laughs> doing a, a job that I love and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not attached or married and I'm dating women that I think are exciting and attractive and I'm buying every animation cell and toy and little, little thing that delights me for my apartment. And, and I, I don't have any responsibility. Oh, we've all been there. Yeah, exactly. It's a great time. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm thinking, you know, th- th- things are pretty good. And my, my love life is not going great. And a- as good as I felt things were, I did recognize that the downside of that was I was also pretty lonely at that time. And I had a lot of expectations about relationships that... I didn't that we're not being met, and I didn't know really know how to realize in a realistic way. Then, uh, just before I, yes. I, I apologize to interrupt you, but sure. that's such an interesting point, especially because especially with the you know the large part of the demographic of the audience. Yeah. But just this idea that it, because I think there is this kind of a, uh, a false idea. Yes, when you're a young, you know, especially uh, like a, you know, I was I was not a very popular kid. I feel a lot of people feel like they were not popular kids, mm-hmm. and so in your head you create this romanticized yes. idea of like. Man, if just girls would, and I could just, if I could just hook up with, yeah. oh, that'd be so. But then, when you, if you get to a point where actually that does happen a little bit, yeah. then it's it all this. It's weird that it's not. It doesn't fill the hole, and yeah. it actually kind of weirdly isolates you more. Yeah, exactly. Because it's you, you're so. At least in my case, I was so fixated on what I thought was the special person or the idea of a special person that. I would deny things, good opportunities that came my way, and I would try even harder to pursue things that on some tiny little level I knew that was not I, – I, I was not close to or would not make me happy. But everything had – I'd convinced myself that, that it was. You know? And I think that in, in, in a lot of ways, like, like you said, when you, when you grow up and you feel like you're unpopular – and you might feel like you're deficient in some way or you need enhancement. You need to either dress a certain way or act a certain way. It doesn't way. just come easily to you yes. like it does for other people that you see. And exactly. You go, oh, it's so fucking easy for them. Yeah, and, and you say, well, you know, if I was a guy walking in with a – beautiful girl on my arm and you know or or I'm I'm dating somebody who's on TV you know my my life will be better by you know ex- extension and it's like uh, anything like that has got to come from inside but you know it takes time to learn that and some people don't learn that and I was well on my way to never learning that <laughs> and because I was you know 
constructing relationships that were kind of doomed to fail and yet convincing myself that I was in it for the, for the right reasons. And then, and then, I mean, I refer to this in the, in the book, I almost take, I take a very Chuck Jones way of depicting a bad relationship, but it was like that where I'd wind up at the end, you know, with a rock headed for my head. And it's like, here we go again, boom. And like the coyote goes through all the machinations to catch something that's elusive and that he can't really get. And if he had it, it would probably taste really terrible, but you know, he can't give up on it. And so my love life was the same way. It was like pursuit and set up for, for, for failure. But it was mitigated by the work I was doing and the, the fun that I was having. So right into the middle of this is, is uh, I'm, I'm walking home one night from a date that had gone pretty much like I just described. Was this here in L.A.? Yeah, it was, it was here in L.A. It was over – we had had dinner over at – oh, God, it was an Indian restaurant, like the Bombay Palace, I think, over on, on Wilshire. And I was living close to there. And the person I had dated that night had parked far away from my house because parking was restricted or something. So I say goodnight to her. I start walking home. And I notice some guys coming up down the street. And there are all sorts of folks who live in this neighborhood. And it's over by Robertson and Lapeer Street. So over over by the Ivy, kind of, yeah. oh, a few blocks Beverly back. Hills-ish for people. Beverly Hills-ish, yeah. Ish, yeah. And um, – so I see these guys coming, and I know a lot of actors and musicians and sports guys, and and I see two African American guys in hoodies, and probably the guys in the neighborhood. You know, you know, they're they're probably fine. And I walk by them, you know, kind of like just continue on my way, and I get close to them, and they start talking in a way that I can only describe as very mocking, like, like they're trying to make fun of me or something like that, and. And I kind of look at them, and then they jump me, and they and they one pinned me from behind, and the other one just started working on my face, and they started screaming, you know, foul language, and uh, and uh, punching me repeatedly, and it was just, you know, it was a setup. I walked right into it, and uh, I just, I, I thought nothing special, and I just was completely unwary, and they worked me over really badly, and there was something in my head that said, don't call out, play possum if you can, because it was almost like they were saying things and doing things to me to try and force me to respond. And I knew that if I did, they were either going to kill me or the beating was going to get a lot worse. And it was, it was pretty bad. At one point, the guy was angling to kick out my knee and I you know, forced myself around. So he kicked my thigh and I went down and it still hurt like hell. But they were really trying to cripple or hurt or, or maybe I, I don't really know what was in their heads they were just it was it was mayhem and uh, they robbed me and they said they were going to blow my head off and uh you know uh it was one of those count to 10 and i said this is it you know there's at some point life just stares at you with the face and it's like there is no way out there is no rescue there's nothing this is it and once I finished counting to 10, I looked and they had gone and I figured, okay, they ran off and I picked myself up as best I could. And my face was all bloody and everything. My nose remarkably was intact. It was a little bit, I, I don't know, maybe the cartilage was fractured a little bit, but my the whole side of my face felt spongy and broken and uh, my teeth remarkably, I still had all my teeth um, and, uh, my side hurt from where he kicked me. And, uh, and I, and I went home and I, as I was crossing the street to get into a more well lit part of the, the street, a uh, car started up from down the street and they sped by almost like hitting me and they were laughing and flipping me off and everything. So they'd gotten to their car. I, they weren't from the neighborhood, I guess. And, and so I had to jump out of the way there and that was like a parting shot. And my first thought was, Oh my God, they're going to skid to a stop and jump out and get me again. But they just kept going. So I walked home. It was two blocks to my house, and I walked in. And, and here's the moment that was like the big one that, that I carried with me all these years. And, and as I was walking to the house, I said, as bad as I feel now, it's going to feel worse when there's going to be nobody inside who's going to say, oh, my God. And I walked in the house, and there's all the toys. There's the jukebox I bought at, the, at an auction. There's the animation cells. There's all, every cool little thing, and I'm alone, and just me. And... That was hard. And, and especially as I, as I had been on a date with a woman that I was kind of following after and convincing myself I had a relationship with, but who, you know, she didn't come home with me and there's nobody there. So that was the start of it all about, you know, questioning a, a lot of the way I had lived and, and what I was going to do about it. And um, 
over the next couple of days, I, you know, in a weird way, I tried to look at you know the positive, and I and it, the only good thing I could say about it is like, well, this gives you a chance to to do it yourself. You know, that's the only way I could I could look at it. My family lived far away. I had friends at work, but nobody was really going to run over and you know, see me or anything like that. And uh, it's the middle of the night also. And it's certainly sympathetic people, but it, from an emotional point, I felt like, okay, you're kind of at ground zero and it's up to you, you know, what you do about this. But first things first, and the next day I went to the doctor and, um, you know, he said that my side of my skull was fractured and it was broken. And he even said that part of the zygomatic arch had been pow- powdered from where he, where I'd been kicked. And I, uh, um, so it was – I had to go – there was no two ways about it. I had to have facial reconstruction. So you know, I was in the hospital for a few days getting the side of my face rebuilt. And I had a wonderful surgeon, so I only have a couple little scars. But it was, it was a very interesting time because the day of the surgery, I lived two blocks from Cedars. So And I thought, I'm not going to take a car. I don't know how long I'm going to be there. So why should I pay for parking? And I just walked over those two blocks and Jesus. I said, here you are. You're walking by yourself to have your face redone and you're, man, you know, you're a man alone. Is this how – do, how did you wind up at this position? And uh, well, uh, Next to like so many of your childhood dreams having come true. Yeah. And still kind of being in this, this weird – Listen, at the end of the day, Batman has Alfred. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I think it's not – like, you know, to not take for to, – to really not skip over the idea of in 1993, yeah. most people didn't have email. That right. Was, you couldn't just, oh, I'm going to Instagram this and then a bunch of people will mm-hmm. rush to my – like there was – you really had to call someone. They had to be home or you That's could right. leave them a message and wait till they call you back. But you right. don't know. People were not accessible. Right, exactly. As accessible, yes, yeah. people were accessible. They just were not very accessible by today's standards. Right, right. So it had to be a couple of days before I had, you know, contact. I mean, my, I called my family right away and let them know. But what, it, after the operation, after I got out of surgery, my sister was there, and she was uh, she was up in uh, Santa Barbara at the time, so she it was easy for her to drive down and, and see me. But my folks and the rest of my family lives in San Francisco, so it was it was harder for them to get down. But it was also just sort of like. You know, you you got to do this yourself, and everybody does it to some degree. You know, it's like you, people have to. Everybody deals with tragedy at some point. Everybody feels like this is my alone moment, and where it's just down to me. And that's where I felt like the story had some validity in telling it. Is that this is just my story, and maybe somebody reading it has gone through something much worse, but maybe somebody who has had something happen to them and they don't know how to cope can look at this and say, you know, if this this guy can get through it, maybe I can get through did it. Did you too. cope through it right with cope with it right away or no, did it was you a long process. it down? It was uh, it was um it was a little bit of feeling like I want to get through this as soon as possible. And at the same point, it, I felt like I my life had sort of stalled out a little bit. I didn't want to go to work. I certainly didn't want to think about writing Batman stories because it just didn't make sense to me anymore. You know, it's uh, did that change your perspective on shows where people were essentially kind of very physical? You know, like did yeah. that was, did, was that a strange thing to be writing, having sort of experienced it? Yeah, I mean, it's like okay, you know, it's like I knew what it felt like to be punched, but I not not to be worked over and savaged. Basically, I felt that um, when I wrote a fight. And I wrote injuries after that. I could feel more from personal experience and and know how a person would feel and react after it based on what I had gone through. Um, but I also began to question the idea of why is there no justice? Why is why am I not a lucky one? If this happened to me, why wasn't why weren't the guys caught? Why wasn't the, why weren't the, the um, why weren't they prosecuted? Why didn't uh, – you know, you, you hear about the person who goes through McDonald's and uh, a, a copy sloshes on them and they sue and they get a million dollars. Well, I'm, you know, my, I'm paying what my insurance won't cover to have my face rebuilt. And, and you know, the universe has said to me, you're shit out of luck, kid. And Next time get mugged by Ronald McDonald. There you go. A much better opportunity. <laughs> I think we all do when we eat there. <laughs> yes, <Okay>. absolutely. <laughs> uh, points. I've had the taste crafted burgers. Yes, that's <laughs> kind of abusive. Enough. What do you think is the most – I mean what – Ultimately, 
Because I think it, it, just hearing the story, seeing the way everything yeah. went, it is it does seem like something good came, or you were able to get something good out right. of it. Yeah. But at the time, what did you feel like was the most substantial thing that they took from you? And I don't mean material, but like, what did you feel like you lost? Uh, dignity uh, for um, uh, for for one thing. Also, a sense of hope. Uh, they had given me a lot of fear. I felt like they had played into the worst opinion I had of myself, which was I'm worthless because growing up as a cartoonist and an artist, you deal with self-doubt and everything. And when some artists deal with the idea like I'm worthless and the only thing that, that, uh, that I have to offer the world or to speak for myself is either my art or my music or my writing or my performance, you know, because inside I, I don't got much. So um, that attack made me feel like, you know, you're not anything other than something to be hurt and punished. And when they started hitting me, that kicked in as scared and as absurd as I was that kicked into something in my psyche, like a, almost like an affirmation of you're worthless. The only thing you deserve to feel is pain. And I don't know how a person develops feelings like that, but in that moment, that's what came welling up. And that tied into something that I had done, you know, I've done abusive things to myself before here and there, and almost in sort of like a I'll show the world type thing. And, you know, been cruel to my, and I get into that in the book a bit. Um, but, uh, you know, here are two guys who really are going to, you know, who, who kind of do this professionally. And they brought out the feel, a lot of feelings of worthlessness, sort of like you deserve it. And I feel that that's a lot of things that people who are in a situation like that feel. And I, you know, it's not right. But people who have been the, uh, abused physically or sexually – they're as wrong as it is. Many people feel like I had it coming, or um, I deserve it on some level, or this is God saying, you know, you're really not all that great. So, how did you get? How did you realize that that wasn't true? Or did facing that? Did was there any sort of breakthrough afterwards that that came from it? Slowly, it it happened, and I think it happened from. And I get into this in the book. Um, at one point, I'm in a very down mode, and I'm mood in the book, and I'm listening to a lot of negative voices, and my conscience or inner voice in the form of Batman says, there are other voices than the one in your head. And how did you discover those other voices? Well, by going out again and by interacting with people and kind of taking a look at the world around me and saying, you know, my life's okay. I mean, I did survive, and I uh, there are people who are anxious for me to resume my life and go back to work. And uh, uh, it, it kind of was summed up in a moment that I also get into in the story where I was out with my sister one night shopping, and uh, and I ran into a guy who just who saw I was wearing a jacket that had the Warner Brothers logo on it, and he said um, he wanted to talk about cartoons and about how much he and his wife loved him, and his wife was sick, and 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 kind of suffering with cancer and how at the end of the day when they could watch cartoons it made it all better a little bit so excuse me so i thought well you know what um that's sort of a good thing to be involved with and uh if i can uh go back to something like that it's worthwhile so you found some healing in being able to help other people. Well, yeah. I mean, it's not just, you know, go resume your job again. It's like uh, I worked hard to get here to have a career doing something in uh, in animation or, or comics. And not a lot of people get that chance. So to walk away from it or just waste it is, uh, is sort of wasting the chance. And, um, you know, I like it when people say – Oh, I really love that cartoon or it was funny or it was, uh, you know, uh, my kid loves it or something like that. And it's not that it's all about me. It's just that it's like I love those things, too. And I love that I have a job contributing to that. And um, to be 
uh, to have this negative image of myself forced upon myself and to suffer more doubt and despair and, uh, and uh, self-abuse is to really let the attackers win and what they stand for, which is, you know, misery and evil. You, it's, it's the only way of fighting back is to go back and do what you, what you do and try not to make the experience um, uh, sour you. And to try and keep your eyes open to not only to protect yourself, but also to um, other ways maybe you can connect with people and to go beyond what you've taught yourself. So at that point, I began the slow process of moving my life away from, you know, being so self-centered, being fixated on people that I felt brought something to my life. And trying to tell myself over the next decade and a half that I was enough. And that was a long, hard process. I equate it, looking back on it, you know, if I was going to put a literary um, uh, um, uh, similarity to it, I'd look at something like the original book version of Pinocchio where by Carlo Collodi where – you know, it isn't as easy in the Disney cartoon. It isn't like, you know, he's knocked out by the whale and, and then he's a real boy. After, you know, he goes back with Geppetto, he works for years going to school and doing errands and, you know, all this stuff. And he has a hard time of it. He kind of grows up during that period. But it takes a couple of years. And then one day he wakes up and um, he's human and the old puppet is in a corner. And he goes, oh, I'm glad I'm not that guy <laughs> anymore. So I feel like it's uh, – it's been a transition away from that guy. I mean, he's still with me to some degree, but it's, uh, if I feel like, and that's why it took me 23 years to tell this. I felt like I needed that time to have perspective on this because if I had told the story within a year or five or 10 of the attack, I would have been too angry and I would have been too much of that. And I felt like I have, this is a story that has to be told by an older man looking back when he was younger and making mistakes and realizing okay, I've come a fair distance and um, I can I can comment on that. And also, once I made the determination to continue on, things got better. Like I became, I became more assured in my writing. Uh, my, my, I think my writing got better. I, more opportunities opened up to me. I created, a, you know, more characters and more, more things uh, at Warner's and, out, and outside of it too. And not everything has been easy or, or a success, but it's never stopped me from trying. And uh, as long as you, if you can keep going, that's, that's the win. It's not a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It's just, you know, you get to, you, you, you get to, you know, walk, watch, you're always in search of the rainbow and, and that's not a bad journey. No, but I think it's also, you know, the the kind of science of measuring the distance between events in your life and looking mm-hmm. back and going, oh, you know, I guess that actually, I mean, it's sort of like, you know, do you, you don't know you're in an era until the era is, yes. you can look back and go, oh, that was an era, that from this, this exactly. that was an era, at the time I was just living my life, I didn't know, uh-huh. so that that was actually a specific era, but, but I think, um, you know, for a lot of people... And I assume for, it sounds like for you too. For a lot of us, it's like maybe we just we weren't given the skills when you're growing up. Like you didn't you didn't really know how yeah. to, where your self worth lies or how yeah. you're supposed to. You know, you're trying to figure it out and socialize with other kids who are also fucked up and have yeah. their own thing. You know, I think you all when you get older, you go, oh, everyone was fucked up. Yeah, yeah. You know, some people got some things easier, but most people were kind of fucked up. Yeah. So. You know, so you try to populate your life with the best you can uh-huh. to uh, comic books and cells and jukebox and all these yes, things. That, yeah. These are the things that must make me feel, you know. But ultimately now, where do you think, where do you think a person's self-worth should lie? Or for people who are feeling empty or just not getting it, whatever they need, like where should they be looking? Well, it's got to come, I mean, as hokey as it sounds, and, and it's got to come from inside. You have to be the one who gives that to yourself, who allows yourself to experience it and to create that for yourself and recognize it and accept it from other, from other people. You can't allow your self-worth to be determined by brutality or bullying or negativity or, or just the fact that you're trying to 
you tell yourself that you're not enough and you have to be something else to impress somebody. And that is one of the hardest things ever because I think that, you know, I'm not a parent, but I, I, I can see where a lot of parents would want the best for their kids and, and, uh, and would be hard on kids and say, you know, you, you got to be like this. You have to grow up this way. And, um, and sometimes that works for a kid. You know, a kid needs structure in his life. But he, they don't necessarily need to be, you know, demeaned or belittled or, um, uh, you know, abused in in some way. And um, I think the best thing that a parent can teach a child, from what I've seen, is that, you know, the instill that the feeling that you are enough, that you. As you are is enough, you know, to be a happy person. You don't need to be the first on the baseball team. You don't need to be the best dancer at ballet. You don't need to do all these things that you just, when you're happy with yourself, that you're enough. Yeah. But, you know, and I think that's valuable. But I also think, you know, on the other hand, I think that sometimes, you know, you look at people who are artists and who are creative, a lot of that is done as a rebellion to try and say something or prove themselves. So I'm hoping there is some sort of a balance that can be struck where a person can feel like they feel good about themselves, but also can communicate some element of that through their artwork or through their, um, through their artistic expression. Uh, it, it's very tricky because a lot of people, uh, a lot of times people get into uh, the creative arts as a way of saying, saying to people, look, I'm here and I matter. Um, However, there are a lot of people who don't have that resiliency or that determination and they just shut down. So, And I don't think anyone would – I mean if you had shut down after that, I don't think anyone would have blamed you. No. You know, but something about your character made you decide even you know, as alone as you were uh-huh. that you were still going to figure out how to pick up the pieces and charge forward and figure out how to create a better life. I mean, something there, something there was a fire in there somewhere. Well, you know, you can sit down and be a victim or you can stand up and go on and you know, you got to stand up, you know, I'll work, you know, it's the choices up to you. And these are choices we make a lot through our lives, maybe every day that we don't really recognize, but, um, victim or hero. That those those are quite often the roles that are that are presented to you, and are you going to take it from the world, or are you going to do something for yourself? I mean, I have the, I apologize for the this is I have the hokiest no, sure. question for you, which yeah. is, oh no, I'll get hokier. Go ahead. Okay, oh. did Batman help you? He did because the character was in my head at the time, and when I was writing the show, I was thinking about him and his world and those characters 24-7, and it's very easy for me to, um, as I live in my head a lot, to personify emotions or feelings or questions with another character. So I've always thought of Batman as just a stern character. I've never really thought of him as a chum or buddy or or. Um, even very likable character, but he's somebody <laughs> who is almost like a mean dad who just says, get up, you know, like almost like a drill sergeant who says, this is not right. I know what's right and wrong. And what's right oftentimes is hard. And there's no room for compromise. It is black and white. There is no room for, for debate. You, if you want to get up and if you want to go on, you have to do this. And when I put it in those terms and when I could imagine his voice telling me that as like dispassionate and removed, it's like, okay, I've got to do that. You know, this is, this is, this is what happens. And I always think of him that way. It's sort of a, you know, once he puts on the mask, he's pretty much a hard ass. Do you hear Kevin Conroy? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh me yeah. Too. Me too. And, and you know, and it's like, I, I always hear Mark Hamill is the Joker and yeah. you know, the Joker is the voice of things like stay in, relax, order a pizza. Uh, you know, you can call in late. You know, your script. You know, your script was supposed to be in Thursday. It's Monday. You could probably weasel till next until Wednesday. Take it easy. Uh, why don't you give that girl a call? Maybe she'll come up. You know, it's all, the voice of temptation, and that's the voice, the inner voice that you know is telling you these things. But at heart, is kind of evil, and it's like there's a. 
There's a bad part of yourself that wants you to fail, that, that knows that the outcome of the easy way is just destruction in some form or another, or it's, it's, it's not the route to happiness. And at one point, um, you know, I, or the writer, can, confronts the Joker and says, you know, to really do what you do, to really give into your mindset, to embrace what you are and cruelty and all that stuff and think and fool yourself into a lifestyle and, or think that you're some way justified in being cruel or using cruelty is, leads the person only to despair. And the Joker says, that's the joke. Of course it does. And he, he knows because nobody laughs harder at, at you than, than yourself in some way. And, and he, the Joker laughs at everybody because he, you know, he, he, he's the ultimate nihilist. He wants to crush things. It, to him, that's great. The Joker, I always think of as a mad artist who just, you know, when, he's he, he, the art of destruction, of totally taking everything away to, to leave you absolutely humiliated. Maybe not even dead, but just at the lowest point that that's nirvana to him that's what he lives for that's and but but there must be i mean did you ever get into dark psychological reasons for why you think he does what what he does he loves it i you know i the other but thing you is, can't just love it like there has to be a there has to be a com, there has to be a thing you know like is that is pain his art or is it just yeah. destruction his art i feel that he that he hate, he must hate himself at some level so much that that hatred must extend to everybody else. And in a weird way, I think he's a 100% sane. I think the things he does, the way he directs, dresses, the way he acts, is kind of an act that he, he's like a performance artist. That everybody, nobody said, everybody says nobody would ever behave that way. And the Joker has this sort of clarity where he knows what he's doing. He enjoys what he's doing. He loves what he's doing. And that comes, it must come from some madness inside him. I mean, I, I think Grant Morrison had said something similar that he's like sane in almost this weird, insane way, or I'm, 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 I'm badly paraphrasing what he, what he or it's almost like a super sanity, I think. And I've often felt that about the Joker too, that to some, his greatest joke is convincing people that he's insane when he's actually just this bastard. And uh, so he's a sociopath, there's no doubt about that. Uh, whether or not he's, he's clinically insane is, you know, is, is another matter. People have also asked me, like, does the Joker ever really love Harley Quinn? And, you know, I, I kind of feel like he's so far gone, like real emotion doesn't work for him, as I do about some of the other villains. But I do think that kind of like uh, um, Pygmalion, he, Harley is a creation of his, mm. like, his, like a masterwork, that he took this trusting person, somebody who was ex, you know, giving him affection, emotion, and attention, and turned her into this sort of twisted work of art. And I think that he loves what she's become. He loves what he made her, what he's made of her. And she constantly surprises him. Mm. So I don't, and I think that may be as close as he can come to it. But um, because I, I look upon him sort of like Pygmalion, a guy who created like a perfect work and, and became obsessed and or enchanted or fell in love with it. I think that voice that you're talking about, though, that says like, don't go in late, don't yeah. do this, have yeah. a pizza, don't do this, do, do this destructive thing. I do. I definitely think that there are. I think there's familiarity mm -hmm. in destruction because it's much easier to control. It's oh, much yeah. easier to knock something down than to build something. Yes. Yeah, which absolutely. Which is essentially largely how the inter internet social stratum works. Mm -hmm. But I, agree, yeah. I do think that um, I do think there's an interesting distinction in the brain between short term and long term, and that yes. and, and the sh the short term voice is can be a lot louder. Yes. Which is what I do think your brain. I do think there are parts of your brain that thinks it's. It thinks it's doing right by you by, well, this thing will feel good, yep. and I want to take care of you, so why don't you just do this thing right now without really having the, um, the skill set to, to, for consequence, long-term planning? Yes. You know, I do think a lot of that is escapism, and I do think a lot of that is like not dealing with things responsibly, and maybe a, a big piece of that is like, well, because you, des you know... You were yeah. going to create this world that you deserve because yes. you don't deserve to get up to here. Yeah. So, you know, how do you – do you have advice for people who are struggling with the short-term, long-term voice? Well, you know, we all fall victim to that. And you're, very, you're, you're, you're really right about that because I find myself de dealing with that 
all the time. I think even for you know people who are make trying to make strides in changing their life, you'll always the the short term pleasures or the short term answer will always be there, and you know you fall for it plenty of time. I know I, know I do, but uh, it's by and largely I think you have to. You, it's so difficult. You have to tell yourself that for the the sake of yourself and the people around you, you have to live beyond that. You have to say, not now, I'm going to do this instead. I'm going to do something that seems to be a little harder, but that I'm actually dreading, but is not going to be that bad once I'm in the middle of it. I feel that people today, you know, uh, uh, you know, young people and, and young adults also have a particular challenge in that, you know, I grew up in the 60s. You grew up in, in the 80s. I, I, Seven, I was born in 71, so uh-huh. 70s, 80s, yeah. I think that when I was a kid, I remember that you got a treat every once in a while. You did something when you were, when, when you were good or when you deserved it. And I've noticed that more and more people are treating themselves a lot more through society, like indulgences and things like that, and that, you know, uh, that um, – Kids maybe get a little bit more than 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 I had or you had, or that um, you know they're they're afforded more time on the phone or or more money or indulgence or something, or like even that. attention and emo- and attention indulgences too. Yeah, with social media. Yeah, and um, I feel like we live in a in a in a, in a we've been conditioned in the last couple of generations to live in a world of treats where why don't I get the treat up front? Why do I have to wait till Saturday and I finish my chores? I want it now and I'm going to scream until I get it now. And, uh, and I feel that that by, by, by going for short term things, by the immediate pleasures, by the going for the treats, we shortchange ourselves from, you know, growing beyond ourselves and our immediate, our immediate wants. I mean, I, I know a lot of people who, who choose to live life a certain way because it's comfortable for them. And even though they they might struggle or or deny themselves things. Hey, I got I'm I'm going to sit home and play games, and someone's going to come by with a sandwich for me, and that's fine. You know, because for me to try and live outside what I've got for myself is scary and it's hard, and I don't know how to deal with it when someone says no. Well, the thing you have to tell yourself is everybody's going to say no because it is hard, and it, it you moving forward is always hard. But at some point, someone's going to say yes, and you have to just let yourself get out there in, in whatever form that takes. You know, you gotta you gotta go forward. I, I am. When I first started thinking about doing the story, I was talking to Kevin Smith about it, and he said, "If that had happened to me, I never would have left my house." And I again, I never would have gone out of my apartment. And I said, "Yeah, you would have. I mean, you know, you make movies, you deal with you know film crews, and you have this whole empire here." And he goes, "Well, if it had hit me at the right age, I probably wouldn't have." And at that point, I was thinking, well, this is, might be a story worth telling because there are people who do not move beyond certain things in their lives. I've known people who've had a tragedy that's happened to them or people nearby and uh, by, or close to them, and they've just said, that's it. I'm scaling my life back to here because I don't want to be hurt. And, uh, and well, nothing will hurt you, but, you know. You may not grow. You may not grow. I mean, and... You know, life is hard. You know, you you you're always going to get shot down. You're always going to have to struggle a bit, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. No, I mean, it, you know, anyone who's achieved things, moderate things, small things, big things. I mean, there's a certain amount of discomfort that they probably had to go through to achieve that. Yeah, uh, you know, like in in most cases. And I think, you know, as someone who up until I was 31 yeah. gave into every impulse because yeah. everything felt good because sure. I, you know, and then the, one of the things that really helped me was just sort of recognizing and, and also part, part of the reason why I'm able to stay sober is because I just go, well, I know the life I don't want. And these are the things that I want. And when I really kind of distill it down, what I say to people is like, write down, figure out things that you want. Like if you have a, if you have a path, uh-huh. It's a lot easier to refer to that when you go, well, why don't I just play games for eight hours? Yeah. Well, because I know I want this, and mm-hmm. I know consciously that that may not get me this, mm-hmm. so I can do this thing 
but it's not going to get me to this, you know. Yeah. And if I have strong emotional reasons for why I want this other thing, exactly, that can be very that can be very motivating. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, my my dad used to say, "There's a time and a place for everything," and he's and he's right. You know, it's. Uh, you you have to be able to, you have to be the the parent to yourself at some point where you say in order for me to get anywhere i have to i have to go beyond or i have to you know deny myself that and you're not even denying yourself you're not giving into this you're you're actually giving yourself something much greater by by going forward by 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 uh pushing aside the short term pleasure i think it's good to practice little in just like almost inconsequential things that just little things that you don't feel like doing that you just do anyway. Yeah. Just to practice, you know, just to practice what it feels like to like, oh, you know, once you do it, it's, yeah. oh, hey, I did that. That wasn't so bad. The thing that I built up in my head, oh, it's going to feel, yeah. oh, I don't want to, you know, but you do it anyway and you go, okay. And then the more you do that, the kind of, it is a muscle like yeah. that. Pushing through discomfort uh, is really a bit of a muscle. I know. And you you got to challenge yourself and, and, and do things. I mean, and not listen to. You know, people who want to tear you down, or because for for whatever reason. I mean, I don't. You know, I I put out my own comic books over, over the years. You know, independent comics, and you know, was at a convention. Somebody came up and said, oh, "I read that thing you that you did about the Christmas elf. That didn't go anywhere. You you failed with that." <laughs> Jesus Christ! It's like and it's like it's wrong. With so me. you failed with that. And and this was another comic creator who said that was never popular. That didn't you know. And it's like I said, well. You're not going to see a Christmas special with that character anytime soon, but I created 44 pages of a comic book that somebody else paid to print, and I didn't have to pay for it myself. And it exists, and I I can I can hold it up and say I did this. Where's yours? Yeah, I mean the the the, the thing that's hard to remember in those moments is that when when someone does that or someone goes out of their way to tear you down, yeah, that's more about them than it is about you. Like, yes, that's it is more about. Whatever their kind of thing is that they're trying to process and do, and I know it doesn't really help in the moment. No, it doesn't. <laughs> but but when you can take a step back and you go, okay, well, that's yeah, clearly be- that guy's problem. Yeah, because inside you, there's a voice that's going, oh, yeah, <laughs> you're right, exactly. Oh, this whole time I yeah. knew this day would come. Yeah, well, but yeah. in hindsight, it's like okay, but uh, you know, at least at least I did something, you know. So you know. yeah, I think it is. I think learning to have those moments where you go. Yeah, maybe, but uh, I'm still going to keep doing this thing I'm doing. So, yeah. you know, I'll just try to do it better next time. I don't know. I mean, I'll just I'll do do what makes me happy, you know. I'm not afraid of failure, and I don't welcome it. But on the other hand, I know that um, you win some and you lose some. And but it's you... a weird word, though. Failure is a weird word because it, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't even – something not working out yeah. doesn't mean that it failed. If you learn something from an experience, yeah. it is innately not a failure because you've – You've learned, you've learned something. You 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 get to take something away. It just may not be the thing that you wanted it to be yeah. right away. But if you can figure out how to mine experiences for you know something useful, yeah. then it's almost always then almost impossible to fail. I know, yeah yeah but yeah but I'm amazed. Like people are, are very negative. I mean, I went back to a studio that I'd worked at before. I. I had gone and I had done a show for Cartoon Network and uh, it, it uh, they yanked it after 13 episodes and and somebody came up to me and said, that show failed. I mean, are, how do you deal with the failure of that? And I said, it's 13 on the air. That's not a failure. It's, it's huge. It wasn't renewed for a second season, but, you know, I, I went out and I, I ran my own show for 13 episodes. Yeah, it sucks that they, they lost faith in... in in live action programming, and they yanked it and 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 buried it. You know, it really, it it stings like a bitch. But on the other hand, there's a little fire in me to do it again. You know, you don't. No cowboy gets bucked off a bull and 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 walks away. You don't do that. You go back until you win the belt. You know, you do your eight seconds on the bull or whatever it is. You just keep going because it's what you do. And if somebody says, "Well, you know, you failed," it's like. Like you said, it's more about them than than it is about you. Yeah, because you know, you you take away something from that experience, and then the next thing that you do is like Breaking Bad. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, exactly. It, it's a, it, you think I'm, Batman would just sit around and do no. nothing? No. <laughs> Would you think he'd sit around for eight years because he's sad because his girlfriend died? No, he wouldn't. <laughs> he wouldn't. Uh, there's a cart. 
Oh. Can get back up. Yeah, there you go. And Superman's all mad at him. What are yeah. you going to do? I haven't watched that movie yet. Oh. I have a long flight coming. Oh. <laughs> it's about to get long. <laughs> Much longer. Oh, well, you, 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 you jumped over, right? You, you, you crossed over. Oh, to You went from death? DC to Marvel. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, you, you crossed over to doing Marvel. Oh, yeah, I did some Marvel stuff. And uh, um, Marvel... Um, Animation and yeah. uh, like I mean, Spider-Man. He also and the Hulk. wrote the greatest video game of all time. The Arkham series is the is fucking. Ma- I remember when uh, hours of my life. Oh yeah, I remember like because I because we've been through a couple since the podcast started. We've been mm. through all of them, mm. and every time it would come out, yeah, you know, Matt oh. would just be like cracking his knuckles, and he'd yeah. come in a couple days later, like. Well, that was fucking amazing. Mm-hmm. I'd blow through the story in like four days. <laughs> I would just pl- I would pound through it, and yeah. I am at. On all of them, I'm at, I'm at like 98% completion. I will not finish the fucking Riddler stories. No, no. I can't. No. I want to, but I can't. Uh, but I, I love them. And but, I told my wife before I, when I first started dating my wife, I yeah. said, just so you know, when a Batman game comes out, yeah. Don't talk. give me two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What I love is like for the first two games, when I, especially with the second one, they released the game at midnight, and I went. I went home, and I and I, I kind of timed myself, you know. So I, I woke up the next morning about eight, and I get on Twitter, and there's like one guy who's going, "Mr. Dean, I beat the game. I got all the way through it. <laughs> I got all the way through. It. I, I I don't know if I got all the prices, but and, and he beat it in eight hours. And there's always one guy who does that, and I write back, "Okay, now sleep. <laughs> Eat, sleep, go to the bathroom, shower." And, and oh just sl- I sleep. Because there's always a guy who has to be the first one through. But you do have to learn how to, I mean, it's all storytelling, obviously. Yeah. But, you know, the type of story you tell in a comic is different than the type of story you tell in 22 one yeah. minutes, twenty two minutes, versus, you know, uh-huh. it's 50 hours of gameplay yeah, or yeah. whatever it is. So, you know. How many pages are those scripts, the arc of scripts? <sighs> it's like a, the Manhattan phone book when you're done with it. It's, it's huge because... <sighs> I don't know, if like maybe four or five hundred pages. I, I, I lost, I lost count. See, what would happen was I would write it in fits and spurts. Like I would, I would have like a monthly goal to meet, writing you know sections of of the game, and I would hand those in, and it would be like, okay, here's the Harley Quinn level. So he's got to. Harley says this to him, coming from the left side. She says this from the right side. You know, mm-hmm. you have to write for every option, and and a lot of times it's like. The, you're writing the same thing. Look alive, bats. And we're okay. Yeah. And there's a, we're like, <laughs> Here I come, Batman. And we're, we're like, hey, surprise, bats. You know. So it's like you're writing the same thing, <laughs> just infinite variations on it because you know she can't say the thing if she's the same thing if she's jumping out at at every angle. And you have to take into account maybe not every motion of gameplay, but at least indicate okay, this is the scene where he jumps from, you know, the the electrical the electrical plate to this one to that one and, yeah. and 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 you indicate that with some idea of the dialogue that's going on back and forth that he has that he has to do and so that's very time consuming and i would do my portion of it and then there's also a separate story unit in in england on rocksteady that would do would, would find a way to meld that gracefully into the gameplay yeah. and they would also come up with uh, we would have an overview of where the game was and the overall game story, but then they would break down the story further in terms of what is feasible to do with the action and the gimmicks that he can so use. So it would be on the them to go, well, the remote battering can carry an electric current, so let's use that to yeah. go in and hit that button. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, is yeah. there anything that no one has discovered yet in any of the games? I have to admit, I don't play the games. I, I mean, I've written a lot of things on there, but the, you know, there are Easter eggs upon Easter eggs, because again, Paul Crocker, who's, who's the head of story at, at Rocksteady, has peppered little things here and there uh, throughout the games. See, I'm a bad loser, and, and if, I, <laughs> if I if I if I jump down the middle of a bunch of punks and one of them hits me with a lead pipe and I'm out, it's like I don't want to do that. I don't want to lose. So when I play the game, I just I'm Batman. I just fly around from the buildings. I'm going. Oh, I'm going to fly over here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> fly over there. Oh, it's there's like to g- kind of experience it from that yeah, vantage point. There's gunshots over there. That sounds pretty bad. I'm sure the police will handle that. <laughs> 
I just want to wear <laughs> the suit. new MO, I'm sure the police will have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. <laughs> they probably got 911. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's. Uh, it looks like two faces down there. Some... Hello, this is Ted Batman. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, looks pretty bad. Well, looks pretty bad. Uh, My secret identity of concerned citizen. <laughs> Sir, yes, are you in a uh, jet? No, no, I think, no, no. I'm at the airport. Yeah, they're robbing every bank at once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, get over there. The guy with a clown face. I don't know. Who knows anymore? Just a guy flying around burning things. You want to <laughs> take a look at that? I'm busy. Uh, we know it's you, Batman. Get your ass. Wait, no. Oh. This isn't Batman. This is billionaire Bruce. I got to go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> this is Bruceman. Batman. Bru- this is Bat- Mrs. Bruceman. 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 Bruce Bruce Who Wayman. made the decision in the, in, the, in the last game in Nightfall to unmask him? I don't know. I didn't. I, I didn't write the last game. Well, I, I gotta know because it's out of control. <laughs> Can you just get on a horn for me and just call someone at Rocksteady? Uh, it's somebody at Rocksteady uh, with the, the third game. You know, I I, I base, You know, I asked about it and they said we're gonna develop the games internally from now on. Mm. So yeah, know. it makes more sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, it makes more sense that story would go that way. <laughs> I, I again, I, I, I no, didn't Paul, play the not game. your fault. Really... Not gonna blame you. Well, <laughs> you just hang in there. You go home, and listen to your jukebox. Yeah. Do you still, what is the crown jewel of your collection? Since we listen, I, I you know, of course, it's it's fun to get those things. They don't. They shouldn't necessarily define you. They shouldn't. You shouldn't expect they're going to fix you. But I bet you have some pretty cool stuff. So what do you? What, what's some things that you have? I I listen to a lot of country western. I listen to a lot of uh, Bob Wills, some Roy Orbison, the Texas Playboys, Texas Playboys. So I, good. I, I love I love that stuff. So I've got. Some, I love his vamping. Yeah. You oh yeah. Will just take a. Yeah. That's the name of the tune. Like he'll tell you the fucking name of the song in the yeah. song. I play Kelso, yo piano pounder. He's always heckling his guys. Yeah. I uh, I um I, I love. I I love Bob Wills and 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 just listening to him like like screaming in the background and 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 ragging on his people. So as for, I've got you know Ida Red or San Antonio Rose. I've got I, I like that and um, there's some uh, old Sinatra stuff that I've got on there. I actually have some, my dad used to be a singer in the fifties. His name is Bob Dini and he had a very short run in the fifties where he was making some records. So I have his records on my jukebox. Oh wow! And he's got this kind of Eddie, excuse me, almost like an Eddie Fisher. I type a quality to his voice. It's somewhere between <coughs> Eddie Fisher and Tony Bennett. So I've got some of his records on my jukebox. I have this one called Coast to Coast. You know, from coast to coast, you are the girl I love the most. You know, it's like 50s wacky stuff, you know. And, uh, and he's, he did a version of Remember Me, which I have on there. And so it's nice, you know, putting, you know, punching it in, listening to my dad. That's really and, nice. Sing on the jukebox and what stuff kind of like that. What kind of art do you have? Uh, I have, uh, I got a little bit of everything. I have, um, I have some nice pieces from people I've worked with, like Alex Ross, who <sighs> did get, gave me some very nice pieces, very generous of him. I have, uh, I have a lot of animation cells. I have the most shameful piece of artwork maybe ever created for DC Comics, which is the cover of Lois Lane, number, I think, 109, which is the I Am Curious black cover. Oh. Remember that one. Oh. <laughs> Oh, it's sort of <laughs> well-meaning at the time and and very progressive, but you look at it now and it's like, oh, oh. oh. You, just, you can just feel your asshole slam shut. Like, oh, I don't know oh I should that even be hanging I don't up know somewhere? If I should. Yeah, I mean, I, I every once in a while I think about putting that one up for auction, but then I realize you know somebody's gonna buy it and burn it, or you know, it's nobody's gonna buy it out of fear of uh, you know, it's it's pretty. I don't, know, I, I don't know how I came by that. It's some some weird trait. I, I let's see. I have the very first. This is a weird one. I have the very first drawing and story featuring Sabrina the Teenage Witch by oh Dan my. DiCarlo. Oh <laughs> wow! And the very first. You know, so she was inside cover drawing of her kind of you know stretched out seductively, and then you know the contents page, and then the entire story. And uh, and um, so that's that's sort of an oddball thing that I have. And. Uh, uh, just a few Kirby pieces here and there. Mm-hmm. I picked up some some weird stuff over the years. A lot of if you look through my collection, it would be like a lot of the stuff is kind of worthless. I mean, it's interesting, but it's like it's purely aesthetic that I that I that I picked up when I did. What do, what do you have? Do you have like a, a crown jewel? I have a couple things that I really like. I have a, a, a an R. Crumb that he Ooh, drew on nice. a. Um, 
he drew on one of those old diner placemats. Oh God, yeah, those are great. Yeah, and it's the it's this it's this kind of like surly looking uh, woman in her fifties and she's uh-huh. topless. Yeah, and she's and she's saying something like, "What are you fucking looking at?" <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. So that's pretty great. Um, I just bought a. Did I tell you guys about this? The yearbook. Did I say it on the podcast or not no, on the podcast? No. Um, I bought a a, um, a yearbook from Bob Clampett's high school. Really? Right wow. There. And it wasn't it wasn't his yearbook of someone else's, but the, the, he drew a bunch of shit in that guy's book. Wow. So there's like there's both covers and a couple of places inside have Clampett drawings that he has Jeez. signed. Yeah. Uh, wow. From the, his yearbook. So that's that's pretty exciting. I, I have a wizard cell. And that's that's neat. Uh, that Bakshi. I that I got at WonderCon that I waited in line and Bakshi signed it. Uh huh. And then uh, yeah, and then the the dot in the line, uh, which I was pretty pretty excited about. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so those are the you know it's not a ton of stuff, but I just it just I don't have a good Chuck Jones thing. I mean, I have the dot in the line, but I don't have a good like. A good Bugs Bunny cell. Yeah, yeah I, I'm missing one of those, too. Those are those are few and far between. A lot of the Warner Brothers stuff didn't didn't last. No, it's, it's fucking heartbreaking when you hear, like, oh, yeah, you know, they, uh, they scraped them off or they used them as Christmas yeah, cards and them, sent right? them yeah. out. Yeah, I mean, the old ass, yeah. like the old, old, old ones. Mm-hmm. And then, um, they, yeah, and then a lot of them just, you know, I think, I think uh, I'd heard stories about like Mel Blanc like fishing some out of the dumpster. Like, yeah, they just fucking throw them away. Yeah, like, I don't need these anymore. I, I think I have two. I've got one from uh, one of the better uh, Pepe Le Pew cartoons, uh, a full body shot of him, you know, standing up, and uh, another one of Taz, kind of looking kind of sick. And I think that one might have been from the Bugs Bunny show when they oh, gotcha. uh, animated the bumpers, you know, and everything. Mm. But still by the crew. Oh, do so. you remember um, a Clampet? Uh, do you remember an Itch in Time? Yeah, yeah. I have a I have one of the drawings of the dog. Oh wow! As he's um, he's it's when he goes to claw himself in the back and he's oh like, yeah yeah one more scratch and you get a bath and I'm like please don't no <laughs> so it's when he goes to claw himself yeah. and the flea is on yeah. the back yeah and then uh and he's then he kind of waves yeah yeah he goes away I have that I have that drawing oh that's great so there's I mean the internet has really made. Mm-hmm. Our lifestyles. <laughs> it almost feels like it almost feels it almost feels like cheating in yes. a way. Like, yeah. You really used to have to hunt the shit down. And I, I know. Like, well, let's go on eBay. I'll just get that. I remember when you know I would I would haunt old uh, toy shows and 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 you know flea markets looking for what I would call like holy grail toys, and these would be things like from my childhood that I either had or desperately wanted and mm. never got, and. I would go to Comic Con asking for things like that, and nobody would have them. And now I, you can r- literally go online and type in something, and there it is, mint in the box from sixty years ago. <laughs> and the other day, I, just to show that it did, I was like, I, think, I want the Mattel talking Cecil the sea, sea Serpent still in the box. Does that still exist? There are four of them, and between <laughs> between two and six hundred dollars. And, and I look around at all the shit in my house, and I'm going, I, I just can't do it. You can't do it, but no. it's, it's there if you want it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we were in Paris recently, and uh, I went to a, a place where my wife and I went to a – it was actually in Belgium – where they had um, devoted a museum bo- devoted to French comics. And they had a really great bookstore where you could buy just any French comic or, or anything translated into French and a, a toy section. And I was looking at maybe getting something for my desk, and there's this character I like called the Marsupilami, which is sort of a little – a jungle – a made-up jungle animal. And he's got like a 40-foot tail. And they had this wonderful little sculpture of him. And he's about this big. And the tail is like this. And I'm going like, I want that, but I can't get it on the plane. And I have no room for it in the house. <laughs> so it stays here. So I save well, myself you know 300 bucks. Is. Yeah. I looked at it. I took a picture of it. So I don't. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. It's yeah. nice that you, it's nice that you know that but, it's a. But it's like, you have to the point where if I have to make room for stuff, it, now, now it breaks because I have to wedge it in there and, and I get sick of looking at it. And so I either sell it or, or I, I, now I'm into divesting. I, if it's not something I just absolutely love, I, I get rid mm-hmm. of it. It really does. Um, it really does activate our specific biological <laughs> need to hunt and gather yeah. and collect. Oh, I need that too. Oh, I need that too. And then pretty soon you just got a house full of shit and then it's all cool. Yeah. But it's not going to love you back. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Mm. And uh, <laughs> Matt doesn't agree. <laughs> Some of it loves you back, Chris. That's left-handed guitar collection. Uh, oh, those love me back. They all do. Oh, yeah. 
I do have a lot of guitars. Except for that. I do. Yeah. Uh, I got ukuleles. I buy, uh, oh, it was yeah? like a bad thing was I would go somewhere and there'd be a nice ukulele and I'd buy it and my wife would go, you know, you could buy that or you could learn to play the one you have. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it's not that one. Well, yeah. This is the magic one. This, this one's, is the one that I can play on. You this know? one's Koa, honey. Yeah, there you go. Well, my fiance now has been surprising me with um, amazing horror movie props. Cause oh, really? Yeah, movies, yeah. So, she, uh, well, I mean, if you would consider this a horror movie, yeah. but it's a, one, a, a, I have one of the gremlins. Oh, yes. Uh, and then she, she came home with one of the wolf heads from the howling. Oh, and then, score. And then, I, and then I come home a couple nights. I know. And, yeah. the, and the company that she got it from modded it so the eyes, you can flick a switch and the eyes glow red. What? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I came home <laughs> I came home a couple nights ago and I almost shit my fucking pants because she bought a... A, a Reagan uh, from Exor- Exorcist. Not it wasn't in, it wasn't used in the movie, but it was made full size Linda Blair though. Y- y- yeah, it yeah. was made for an attraction, and uh, it is even as a horror fan, it's fucking terrifying. Oh shit, man, yeah. that is scary. <laughs> she used to live across the street from us, Linda Blair in, in Burbank. Yeah. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah, she rescued dogs and was always trying to get us to take one. But did you? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we we do have rescue dogs, but we we couldn't take, take you couldn't those. take no, those. No, oh no. man, she was a very good neighbor. She she moved out to a, um, Agua Dulce, I think. Um, but it is funny, like when you when you are collecting stuff. Like I was, you know, occasionally I'll buy stuff if I, you know I feel like it would be, look good in the house or something. And I, about a couple of years ago, I was online with Harry Knowles, uh, Any Cool News, and, yep, and, and and I was I was also bidding on an auction. And I said, I'm bidding on this great thing in this auction. And he said, What is it? And I said, um, It's one of the paintings from the Haunted Mansion. Yes. It's, Which one? It's the girl with the parasol the par- over the yeah, crocodile. The, yeah. And I said, I think I have a good chance of getting it. There's only one other bidder. And Harry went away for a second. He goes, that other bidder is Guillermo del Toro. And I said, tell Guillermo <laughs> to, he can, to enjoy his painting. <laughs> I know Guillermo. And I know. Them. It's like, I knew that he had I'm out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guillermo has another one of these. Like, that's what Lydia said. She was yeah. like, Guillermo has one of the other ones of these. Like, well, of course he does. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I mean, I'm a haunted man. Oh, there and, you go. Uh, there we go. And Rob Zombie has one of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's, got, he's got one of them. Do you know David Mann? Mandel for producer on he, uh, yep. Seinfeld and Veep. Right. Uh, oh, okay. He's got everything else. You know what you Dave, and I yeah. don't have, and those other two guys. Dave, Dave literally. Dave has everything. Else. Everything. He's got the Dave Cave. You want the polar bear from Lost? He's got else. it. You want the fucking barrel from Jaws? I'm sure he's got that too. Like, he's got yes. Khan in his living room. Yeah. Not not you know Ricardo Montalban preserved his Khan in his living room. There was a there's a TV director named Rich Carell. Uh, Do you know uh, Rich? I, I've heard the name. Yeah. Rich um, lived in uh, lives or at last I heard lived in Hancock Park, but I worked with him on a couple things years and years ago. Uh-huh. And uh, he has one of the largest personal horror collections of stuff. Like wow. he actually has one of the original exorcist dummies mm. and he would open his house I and mean, like most of it was in storage but he would bring a bunch of it to his house for halloween just to have these insane yeah i would ne- i would not let anyone there's a guy near. who kevin uh, kevin uh was filming a pilot kevin smith and yeah he went to this guy's collection this tv writer who decided oh everyone's throwing all this stuff out i better collect as much yeah. of it as i can and this guy literally has like everything you could imagine, including the set of Cheers. <laughs> wow! <laughs> wow! He just owns. He Cheers. has the set of Cheers. He wants to open a museum in Santa Monica with all the shit. He has like this insane collection, like you, anything you can Why think of. Why wouldn't he do that then? Well, it's a you know he I, spends a lot of money on buying Cheers. <laughs> uh, last year, I worked with a with a really great um, director over at Disney named Sean Bishop, and he is a huge Cheers fan. And in fact, his office at Disney is a recreation of the Cheers bar. Oh right down, to the, it, you walk in there, and it's all, I it's all there. I mean, his 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 workspace is behind the bar. He he res- researched it meticulously. He had all the stuff there. He had all the alcohol. He had he had everything, and it was the Cheers bar. I heard George went. Wait, to just you said it. was. What happened? Is it not there anymore? No, it's not there anymore. Uh, we we were working on a project. It it it, it kind of went south, and, and that was that was that. But it was um. But well, that's okay because right when the show ended, uh, Diane shows up at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sam chooses the bar. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that was always the love of his life. Yeah. 
<laughs> but he, uh, Sean's one of He's these guys a man. who's like uh, you know a huge fan and but a, a tremendous artist and builder. And he he built uh, his own Ecto One that he was driving oh, around fuck. in. So it's like that. Wow. It's getting to that point where I got to be friends with him. Well, yeah. this is this has really been a wonderful conversation. And Didn't I, we start? Because I didn't. You know, we, did we haven't start. started. We haven't oh, recorded okay. any of this. <laughs> so, Paul, yeah, we, how's it been going? It's been okay. Uh, any muggings? Uh, to you uh, not so uh, much. Okay. Uh, okay. But I do think it's. I I, I think. Uh, oh, yeah, as long as we're on collecting, I have to say I love the set from your. From your show with the with the, the like the Victorian uh, uh, oh, serial killer thank you. Set. yes and with the taxidermy and everything yes. like that it's like I love that that's that's my office at home I've got I've got a bunch of that that same type of weird oh my stuff God. in well, that's his house you gotta yeah, go yeah, yeah. House. I mean yeah. I actually got to say this to because you know Lydia said uh, I heard Guillermo's family like makes him keep all his stuff in a separate house and she was yeah. like that's never gonna be the case and I go I really appreciate that because I I got to say this sentence. To my fiance a couple days ago, sweetie, if you keep buying all these horror props, there's not going to be enough room for our taxidermy. That was a real <laughs> sentence that I said in a very sincere wonderful, way. Wonderful. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And she's like, okay, I'll try not to buy so many horror props. I'm like, don't, st- I'm not saying stop. I'm just saying, like, we yeah. need to think about where all this stuff is going to go. Uh huh. You uh-huh. know, like, uh, like or do, do we put, do we, does the antelope go here? Does Reagan go here? Like, we need to yeah. know where this is going to. So uh, I, I I always I, I don't know what it is about that aesthetic, but I just always wanted to live in a in a history museum. Me too, in a natural I, history museum. People come into our house and there's a, there's a chair for the guest. They sit down they, in the chair and then they look they look over there, and there's a life size mount of a Tasmanian tiger with his mouth doing that big yawn. Oh thing, yeah, just staring at them and and. You know, people are always like trying not to get bitten by the thing, <laughs> and it was it was made for me by a guy who makes recreations of animals for me because you're not going to get a stuffed Tasmanian tiger anymore. But it's it's uh, it, it's 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 perfect in every detail, other than the fact that you know it's it's a recreation. But that's sitting in our living room because. One, we like it. Two, there's no place else for it to go. <laughs> and we'd have to kick, like, like you said, I'd have to kick the honey badger out of the, <laughs> the dining room. That's his space. They, the honey badger's got the dining room. The thylacine has the, the living room. And Well, you, you know, know, I mean, like in the dining room, we could either put the, the, the howling w- werewolf or I have a piebald peacock. So, you know, it's like, yeah, there you go. <laughs> which one? And you can't put those two together because the werewolf's going to eat the peacock. So it's like. What do you do? These are legitimate de- uh, <laughs> design problems for people like us. You know, uh, it is a, it is a, you know, it is, it is a blessed luxury life. But you know, it's like, but when you really strip it away, you go, you had this horrible thing that happened to you. You got through it. You were able to make something out of it, and mm. you were able to kind of create this life that yeah. you know is now fulfilling, where you still get your toys, but you know they don't mean everything. Well, the first time my wife, you know, back when she was my girlfriend, came to came to my house to spend the weekend. She walks up into the house that I, that I had at the time, opens the door, and there's a muskox looking at her. I said, What's that? I said, oh, that's a muskox. Why? It's, well, I do this card comic. I mean, it's convoluted. I do this comic called Jingle Bell, and she's Santa's daughter, but she doesn't have a reindeer. She has a muskox because muskoxes are cooler and smelly and everything. She's going, yes, and why do you have it? Well, the artist didn't know what it was, so I had two choices. One, I could Google muskox and give him a link, or I could buy this from a hunter's <laughs> club in Georgia, have it shipped out, take a picture of him, and get it to him that way. So I made the most logical choice. Yeah, well, that's how dedicated your craft the you best are. The best writer. Yes, yeah. that's, that's right. That's right. Do pl- uh, plug everything you want yeah. at the end. Like, what, what's everything that you want to plug? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I, I, I mentioned it at all. You know, Dark Knight. The book is coming out in 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 June, um, which is the story. That's the story of of, of of the mugging, which I read um, today, and it's fantastic. Thank you. Everyone should grab a copy. Uh, that's. I'm working on a ton of stuff that I can't talk about simply because it's it's either in animation or it's hasn't been announced. But there's cool stuff coming. Maybe a year down the road, and and I'll let you know the the folks who control it announce that at the, at the time. Uh, I've got another Jingle Bell book coming out this Christmas from IDW. It's going to be a compilation of all the old stories and some new stuff. A big hardcover omnibus, and uh, it's pretty much it. You know, that's that's it. I, I, I'm this is a weird time for me where I'm I'm in development and I'm writing pilots and I'm creating a ton of new stuff, but I just can't can't talk about it till you know I know how it's going to go. 
Well, I, I admire your fortitude because it Thank is you. difficult to keep those things in. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I will try not I – will, I will fight the urge to just poke and poke and poke and get something. But uh, I, will, I will respect your cone of silence. But, um, but at, at least till the mics go off, then I'll tell you. Anything. <laughs> yeah, Dave funny. Mandel probably owns, oh, they are owns off the cone now. of silence. Oh, these microphones <laughs> yeah. are off. Yeah, yeah. Boy, these microphones sure are off. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I really appreciate you – Coming in and being open about your story, and and I Thank mean, in you. general, are you, you do you do you feel are you are you happy now? Do you feel good? Do you feel fulfilled? Yeah, I I the other this is a weird thing that only animation geeks will, will get or Disney fans. Yesterday, the book came to the house, and and I, I, I unwrapped the first the first uh, copy, and Misty, my wife, said, "How do you feel?" And I said. Oh. Do you know the ending of The Great Mouse Detective? And she goes, yeah. <laughs> Remember after Basil defeats Radigan, he goes home and he's got the bell that Radigan used to summon the cat and he takes it and he puts it on the shelf and there it is and he walks away from it. That's how I feel. And I took the dark, dark night that I just flipped through, put it on the shelf, walked away from it and cracked, and cracked open a marsupilami French book that had arrived that day and read that instead. <laughs> and she said, your book came out and you're reading a French book about a, 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 a possum, basically. And it's like, yeah. And because I've told that story and that's there and that's for everybody else, I'm, I'm getting back to the more serious stuff. Excellent. So that's how I feel. I've taken my little trophy of my big adventure, put it on the shelf, and, and there it is. And well, excellent. Thank, thank you, you so much, Paul. It was really great chatting with you. Thank man. you. Please come back sometime. I'd love to. This is this most fun ever. I'm so glad. All right, enjoy your burrito, everyone. The end. Now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito. This episode of the Nerdist Podcast was brought to you by CISO, the all-comedy, ad-free streaming TV service made for serious comedy nerds. If you love Community, if you love Rick and Morty, then you have to watch your CISO's original new series, Harmon Quest, which I've actually done. I didn't do this version of it, but I've done it before. And it's amazing. It's improv, animated, live-action journey into fantasy role-playing. It's an RPG with uh, Dan Harmon and his comedy companions, uh, Spencer Crittenden, Aaron McGathy, Jeff B. Davis... Uh, also, guest stars Aubrey Plaza, Thomas Middleditch, Steve Agee, Paul F. Tompkins, Ron Funches, many more people that you love. You can watch every episode of Harmon Quest on CISO now. Go to CISO.com, use the promo code Harmon Quest to get two months free. Uh, that is an extra month on top of the already free trial. Thanks, CISO, for sponsoring this podcast. <laughs>